Hello everyone and welcome to this training session on NFRA Internal Controls Framework and Principles. Today we are going to go through some of the key details that you will need to know from NFRA Internal Controls Framework and Principles. In terms of an agenda, I will be covering off the main sections of NFRA from a high level perspective and giving you an overview of the key concepts to be aware of as part of today's training session. Just to flag from the start, we can't cover everything in full detail so there is an onus on staff to read through the document itself, just to ensure that they're fully briefed on their day-to-day -day requirements. Firstly, what are the National Financial Regulations? So there are a set of policy documents which set out financial controls for the organisation. They are not meant to be detailed procedural documents for financial processes or activities, as these are contained within your local procedures. But the aim of the NFRs is to provide high-level controls to guide your local procedures. Secondly, why is this particular training important? It's important that you're aware of the guidance that you must follow with regards to the internal control framework and its principles. Moving on to an important question which discusses who is the actual target audience of the NFRs. In short, the NFRs have a very broad reach. They apply to all permanent, temporary and agency staff of all HSC divisions, CHOs, hospital groups where services are provided on behalf of the HSC, and Section 38 and 39 providers, where services are being provided on behalf of the HSC or where HSC grant aid and funding is being received. Moving on to the purpose of NFRA. So NFRA provides an overview of risk assessment and management procedures in the HSC. It provides guidance on the HSC's control environment and requirements. It provides guidance on the NFR framework, its importance to the HSC and local obligations. So NFRA may be viewed as an introduction to the NFRs, providing an overview of how the NFRs form part of the HSE's internal control environment, and an outline of essential elements to a successful control environment. Okay, so what is compliance first of all? So compliance is the process of making sure your company and employees follow the laws, regulations, standards and ethical practices that apply to your organisation. So I suppose from a HSE perspective, it operates in a highly regulated environment. So that requires a strong control framework in order to comply with Irish and EU statutory and regulatory requirements, achieve best value for money, and that they are consistent with government policies and guidelines. So there's different regulations that the HSE operates in, and that includes things like legislation, government directives and circulars. So for example, the HSE is required by the Health Act 2004 under Section 35 to have a Code of Governance. So what this does is it sets out the processes and guidelines that we have to follow to ensure that we're complying with the re reporting requirements imposed by the Health Act 2004. It also sets out internal controls so that it includes your procedures that's in place relating to internal audits, risk management, procure public procurement and financial reporting as well. The HSC also needs to ensure that they're following the Code of Practice for the Governance of State Bodies. So what that actually does is it states that the board is responsible for ensuring the effective systems of internal control are implemented, including financial, operational and compliance controls and risk management, and the board reviews the effectiveness of these systems annually. In relation to the document framework itself, so the NFRA document covers the internal controls framework and principles, so it consists of the overarching principles, governance and general controls of the NFRs. The B documents are broken down into seven separate areas and they're intended to be operational regulations which are very much aimed for practical audiences. So they deal with topics such as procurement, travel and subsistence, payroll and property and equipment. Then there's two C documents and they mainly relate to custodian regulations including PPP, RISMAC and supported banking. So areas which govern the HSE's responsibilities to protect the property of those under its care. Lastly then, the NFRD document, and that focuses on financial reporting, so mainly around the creation of the annual financial statements. We have a responsibility to ensure the efficient and effective use of the HSE's resources. Complying with the NFRs will help us do this, and it will also ensure the HSE's interests are protected. All staff are responsible for being aware of and compliant with the controls outlined in the NFRs. The NFR has set out the minimum standards of financial controls that are acceptable across this very large and diverse organisation. 
However, budget holders may decide to apply a higher level of control than the minimum set out in the regulations in order to achieve the objectives of the NFRs. For example, expenditure control could be amended for local use so that the value that each grade has approval authority for could be lower than the allowed by these regulations. To be compliant with the NFRs, you must also be compliant with the Code of Standards and Behaviours. This code requires you to carry out your responsibilities carefully, honestly and fairly, and always act within the law. Never seek to use improper influence, in particular never seeking to use political influence to affect decisions concerning your official position. Follow guidelines in respect of offers or gifts or hospitality, and avoid conflict of interests. A conflict of interest is any situation where a relevant staff member has directly or indirectly a financial, economic or any other interest which might be perceived to compromise their independence. It's important we touch on how the NFRs and IFMS, the Integrated Financial Management System, will relate to one another. So IFMS will be rolled out across the local areas on a phased basis. To facilitate this, there may be particular sections within the NFRs that will have two versions, one for areas where IFMS is in use and a second for areas where it is not in use. It will be clearly outlined in the document where this is the case. For example, once the IFMS rollout begins, the NFR guidance on approving purchase orders may look like the example here shown on screen. If your local area is using IFMS, you will follow the yes path, and if not, you will follow the no path. So just keep an eye out for this when IFMS rollout begins. The control environment relates to the set of policies, procedures and standards implemented by the HSE in order to achieve an effective system of internal control across the organisation. Internal controls are designed to manage and reduce risk. The aim of these controls are the safeguarding of people and assets, accuracy, completeness and reliability of financial information, improved efficiency, preventing fraudulent behaviour, and compliance with appropriate laws and regulations. So in the next few slides, we will discuss further aspects of the internal financial control in the HSC. So firstly, I will discuss risk management and risk assessment. So risk management is the process of identifying, monitoring and managing potential risks in order to minimise the negative impact they may have on the HSC. Through risk management, the HSC can proactively safeguard HSC's interests and patient safety, as well as preparing for potential risks such as security breach, data losses, cyber attacks, system failures, liquidity issues, litigation and natural disasters. An effective risk management process will help identify which risks pose the biggest threat to the HSE and provide guidelines for handling them. And you can refer to the HSE Integrated Risk Management Policy for more information on this. Moving on then to risk assessment. So a risk assessment is the process of reviewing the HSE's activities to identify risk, analyse and evaluate the risk, establish a plan of action to mitigate the risk as much as possible, implement the action plan, so in other words, carry out the actions to mitigate the risk, and establish and monitor controls to continue mitigating the risk. This information is then used to make various operational adjustments in order to reduce those risks that are considered to be excessive. All risks and associated mitigation plans should then be recorded in a risk register. I know we speak about internal controls throughout the NFRs, but what are internal controls? So internal controls are ongoing processes and procedures that are designed to provide reasonable assurance that the HSE's operations are effective and efficient, the HSE's financial information is reliable, and the HSE meets its regulatory compliance obligations. The goal of the HSE system of internal control is to manage and reduce risk to an acceptable level rather than to eliminate it. The system of internal control seeks to ensure that assets are safeguarded, transactions are authorised and properly recorded, and errors and irregularities are either prevented or detected in a timely manner. The system of internal control is also designed to ensure appropriate protocols and policies are in place and are operating effectively in the context of clinical and patient safety. So there's two main types of controls. Preventative controls prevent issues from occurring. This includes preventing financial errors, fraud, theft, 
breaching regulation and so on before they actually happen. Detective controls find errors. Irregularities or other issues that have already occurred. By detecting these issues, the HSC local areas can take corrective action in a timely manner. Segregation of duties is another key control activity that staff should be aware of and it's used to separate responsibilities over various tasks, including authorising and recording transactions and maintaining assets. Inadequate segregation of duties can be a controls failure for the HSC, and this deficiency could result in a greater potential for fraud and errors in processes and financial reporting. Proper segregation of duties establishes that the critical steps of a process are dispersed between different individuals or teams. This means that a different person will handle processing at various stages of a transaction, ensuring that the person who is tasked with inputting, requesting or creating a transaction is not the same person who approves it. So nobody should have final decision on purchases of goods for their own day-to-day -day use. By having appropriate segregation of duties in place, both the HSC and employees can be protected. Segregation of duties should be evidenced and recorded to maintain audit trails. To create effective segregation of duty controls, you should identify the distinct key steps of a process. For example, there must be segregation of duties between the person raising a purchase order and the person recording the receipt of the goods or services ordered. Once the key steps are identified, you must ensure segregation of duties exists between them. In this example, the person who creates the purchase order should not approve it, and the person who approves the purchase order should not be receiving the goods. And as I said, this is just all to prevent fraud, theft and error from occurring. So there are a number of key elements and features of the HSE's internal control environment. Moving on then to the annual financial statements and the audit process. So the HSE is required to prepare annual financial statements. The annual financial statements will comprise of a statement of financial position as at financial year end, an account of income and expenditure for the financial year, and any other additional statements and information required by the HSC. They must give a true and fair view of the assets, liabilities and financial position of the HSC as at the financial year end. The Audit and Risk Committee, the ARC, advised the HSC Board and the HSC CEO on financial and compliance matters relating to their respective functions. They also advise on the appropriateness and effectiveness of the HSE's procedures. They provide oversight and advice on the HSE's internal controls, the HSE internal audit function and other such functions. The internal audit division of the HSC is responsible for ensuring that audit work is carried out annually throughout the HSC. The purpose of this audit work is to provide assurance that controls and procedures are operated in accordance with best practice and appropriate regulations and ensure recommendations for the improvement of such controls and procedures are implemented. Another aspect of the internal control framework is financial planning and budgeting. So it's a key activity for the HSE and it assists the organisation in determining how much money can be spent based on the priorities set out by the HSE Board and the Minister for Health. A budget holder is a member of staff who has the authority and is accountable for the expenditure of HSC funds. They should act responsibly in making expenditure decisions and proactively manage their available funding to ensure value for money at all times. Value for money is the optimal use of resources to achieve the intended outcomes from a HSC purchase or from a sum of money spent by the HSC. It is not only based on the cost of the purchase but also on the maximum efficiency and effectiveness of the purchase. A full list of budget holders' responsibilities can be found in section 5.12.1 of NFRA, so I would encourage every budget holder to read through these so they are aware of their duties. It is vital that security measures and physical controls are in place to safeguard equipment, stock, cash and other assets. The following are examples of security measures which may be taken. Placing assets in a locked storage area where access is restricted to authorised personnel. Placing cash in a locked safe. Only taking the required amount of cash from the safe to fulfil any purchase requirement. Designing local procedures to ensure stock access is restricted to appropriate personnel and defined procedures are in place for stock movement and traceability, such as signing out of medicines and equipment from stocks. 
Another example of a security measure is placing files of importance in secure filing cabinets. And finally then, recording all assets entrusted for safekeeping by clients and keeping them in a restricted access area with associated procedures for signing out on any items. It is the responsibility of all HSC staff to ensure that personal files of service users are kept secure and managed in line with HSC standards. Whistleblowing is the term used when a worker passes on information concerning wrongdoing. The wrongdoing will typically, although not necessarily, be something that they have witnessed at work. Whistleblowers are protected under the Protected Disclosures Act 2014. A protected disclosure can be made by workers who disclose information which came to their attention in connection with work, and where there are reasonable grounds to believe it shows wrongdoing, such as criminal offences, failures to comply with legal obligations, oppressive, discriminatory, grossly negligent or grossly mismanaged acts or omissions by a public body, concealment or destruction of information about any suspected wrongdoing, endangering the health and safety of individuals, damaging the environment, misuse or waste of public funds, and concerns of a clinical nature. Protected disclosures can be made to, to protected.disclosures at hse.ie. Those who receive protected disclosures or who subsequently deal with them cannot disclose any, any information which may identify the person who made the disclosure. Moving on then to the CAR process and the role it plays in internal controls. So under the Code of Practice for the Governance of State Bodies, the HSC must complete a formal annual review of the effectiveness of the system of internal controls. One of the tools that is used to measure the effectiveness of the HSC system of internal controls is the Annual Controls Assurance Review Pro Process, the CARP. The CARP is a regulatory requirement that the CEO and the Board must fulfil to the Minister for Health. The key components of the CARP are Internal Controls Questionnaire, Controls Assurance Statement, the CAS, and the Statement of Positions Held. The CARP allows the HSC to not only identify potential areas and activities which may require additional support and focus, but also insists in highlighting the strengths of the HSC's control environment. So that brings me to the end of the training session on NFRA Internal Controls Framework and Principles. On this slide is the contact details of the Governance and Compliance team if anyone has any questions. So you can contact us on govn.compliance at hse.ie. On this slide as well, we have some useful training resources and also our Governance and Compliance YouTube channel. And that contains videos of each of the 11 individual NFRs and they're good to watch. Most of them are just 15 or 20 minutes long, so they're good to watch if you want a refresher on any of the NFRs. Your attendance and your attention today is very much appreciated and thank you for taking the time to watch this training session.